Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah McIntyre, and today I'll be talking about um, the benefits of the rhythmic elements of hip hop on um, children's emergent literacy skills. And um, my research is funded through the SUNY Potsdam Transnational Scholars Program. Um, I can talk more about that at the end. So uh, I'd like to start off with a quote that I found while I was reading um, one of the one of the books I've been reading for my research. Uh, the skills developed in the music classroom may take children far down the road to becoming better readers. So music and literacy are inherently just connected, not only through words, but through the elements of words. And we'll talk more about that. So um, I'm going to start off with a preface. Um, I'm acknowledging that I come from a point of privilege as a white person, a white woman who is able to attend university to become an educator, especially in the music field. Um, I'm aware of my privileges and I'm like working to help break the stigmas of race and I am working to educate myself and learn from the black and brown folks who face more barriers than I do when trying to educate um, non-people of color because I would rather learn from someone and help break those stigmas and share than just spread false information. Uh, so there's also a lot of preconceptions about the early literacy period. Um, early literacy development does not end at age eight. Uh, many educators believe that early, early literacy skills don't need to be built on after second grade, and this is definitely not the case. Students will continue to develop early literacy skills late into middle school, except or especially if they are a little later on in their development, and um, this notion is, is rooted in implicit bias. Educators are always stuck on a timeline for our students, um, and not all students have developed all of their liter literacy skills by age eight, especially if those students are uh, with special needs or uh, learning in a struggling school district. So here you can see a graph the dotted line here is the black-white gap between uh, student test scores, so how white students do on tests versus how students of color do on tests. And the dark line is income gap, so it's very clear that as the income gap between these students increases, the test scores decrease. So what is early literacy? We can create a better definition of early literacy, I bet you can barely see it, um, than what is uh, typically conceived by educators right now. If we define early literacy based on these skills developed rather than an age range, we can help our students develop their literacy skills to their best abilities on their own rate. So more about emergent literacy skills, they're based on kind of three pillars. Uh, there's phonological awareness, alphabet knowledge, and print concepts. In the alphabet knowledge stage, um, students can become more aware of the letters that make up a word or a sentence and what they sound like and look like. And this is why it's so important for you to sing the ABCs to your kids. Um, so some learning targets are, I can name the letters and their sounds, and I can sound out the letters that make up a word. For uh, phonological awareness, children begin to become aware that words are made up of sounds, and this is where the concept of syllables are introduced, so you'll see a lot of kids going banana and like clapping out all of that. That's, they're developing um, phonological awareness through all those motions. And then for print concepts, Children can, uh, they can now identify letters, words, and sentences in their everyday lives, and they can name like the physical parts of a book. So like the front cover, the back cover, the spine, pages, and they'll point out like, oh, that's the word book. Like, I don't know. <laughs> so how does all of this connect to hip hop? Hip hop is built on community, just like reading and uh, building literacy skills is. It starts with young people. Hip-hop is, is, is a genre that all kids, especially kids of color, can resonate with, and it allows young people to share their voices and be appreciated by people of all ages. It also creates representation. 
Black and brown students are often left out of mainstream media, especially in education, and you can even see that through like pictures in textbooks. Hip hop encompasses all groups of people, no matter their skin color. It was created by and for black and brown folks. By being an inclusive genre, students can resonate with what they're learning about. It also encourages participation. Hip hop was created by a diverse group of people. We need all people to create all the different elements that combine to create a great hip hop work. So like the DJ, the MC, the B-boy, B-girl, and the graffiti artist, all of those different elements need to come together to create a great hip hop work. It requires multiple people to put forth skill in different areas of the art, and this will allow all students to really show their stuff when they're learning and see their own personal progress. So a little bit more about the connection between women and literacy. Uh, all children have a background in music, and it's our job as educators to utilize that background and put it into our lesson plans to help them understand more. Um, children are already familiar with hearing and sometimes speaking language. Some children are non-speaking. Um, but being able to hear or read words to a song and then listen to it makes them easier to hear them more. So that's how listening to music um, can allow students to form a deeper um, connection and experience with language. And we can help our children learn about literacy skills the same way that they can, we can help them learn about music. So for rhythm and language, rhythm and tempo are the organizing principles of speech and language. Without them, there would be no structure to any language or speech. Uh, if you think about how we're talking, how I'm talking right now, I'm pausing for different reasons. I'm speaking at different tempos for different reasons. And especially with face-to-face -face interactions, which we haven't really had a lot of since COVID, um, you can see a lot of those differences. Um, so repetition, pauses, and speed of speech is something that linguists analyze heavy. Uh, there, these are all critical elements of both speech and music, and you can see that in like written out sheet music with the tempo marking and you know crescendos and decrescendos. And if you were to transcribe what I was saying right now in music terms, you would be writing all of those things too. Pauses in speech can act as a point of connection between audience and speaker, just as in music. Pauses are used to appeal to emotions and create tensions or surprises, just as they are in music too. Pauses are also used in speech during times of stress, forgetfulness, or frustration. And these pauses, like I said, also occur in face-to-face -face interactions, similar to forgetting a note or slipping your fingers while you're playing, or pausing to remember what you were trying to play or say in, uh, when you're playing music or speaking right now. So like I said, rhythm is what creates structure and organization, not only in language, but also in music. There's lots of repetition in music, therefore solidifying words, letter sounds, and melodies. So if you think of songs like um, Old MacDonald, you sing about the cow like eight million times, and you go E-I-E-I-O and all that. But th that helps the kids solidify letter sounds, words, sentence structures, all of that without even noticing. A prime example of this too is music that has been passed down through oral traditions like dances, chants, um, songs that are put to movement, and more. And music is sequential, and so is reading. So in music, you have like typical song structures, like a verse, then the chorus, then the verse, then another chorus, then a bridge, then like the outro. And in reading, it's the same way. We read from left to right. We read our letters first, then we read words, then sentences, paragraphs, on and on. So I think it's very important to also address the educational barriers in this. There's a lot of oh, oh there we go. There's a lot of assumptions and misconceptions surrounding um, hip hop, especially in the music classroom. So one of the assumptions that I would like to point out is um, we often say that kids do so much better in academics if they play an instrument, um, but the reality of that is urban students 
are behind their suburban counterparts in basic reading and math skills and may lack the abilities needed to combine mental and physical tasks required for daily music practice routines. They also may be unable to purchase an instrument or take the time to learn it. And as all of this obviously doesn't apply to just urban schools or there may be some kids in urban schools that can't afford to have music lessons or like, I'm making general statements right now, but um, the reality is you can't put music in service of another academic discipline. So what can we do? What do you think that we could do about all of this to kind of turn it around? That's okay. Yeah. I think trying to put it all together, like not, not in a literal sense, but in, in the sense that, you know, the, the teachers in these schools can say that all of this connects at some point in your life. Mm -hmm. So understanding that now will, will help you a great deal in the real world. Yeah, for sure. And something I read about is even starting band programs further back. So instead of, okay, and again, this is how we're stuck on that timeline. Okay, we start band in fourth grade and you go right into large ensembles and you sit there and you learn how to play your instrument. And then in fifth grade, you're still in band, but maybe you have pull-out lessons now. And then you're band, 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 band. And we put so much stress on the large ensembles, which is totally making sense. But we can start our band programs in sixth or seventh grade. There's like nothing saying that we can't. And in fourth and fifth grade, we can focus more on pull-out lessons, if that's possible in your district, rather than the large ensembles. This allows students to have a lot more one-on-one -on -one experience with the teachers to form a bond between teacher and student and also so they can learn daily practice routines and disciplines and um, spend more time with their instrument too. They can also see their progress at their own pace and um, it's easier for them to see personal goals in themselves rather than in just the ensemble. And then they can take what they learn in these one-on-one -on -one lessons to the large ensemble and they'll feel more grounded in that experience and that they're really making a difference. And this can have, this can, take place in any school, really. So I have some a couple charts about um, music in primary and secondary schools. Now this may not look like a big difference, but once you look at the numbers, it is kind of significant. The pink is um, public primary schools that offer music education, but it's very broad in what like music education actually is. They don't take into account the teacher's experience um, the amount of music experience that they're given in the schools. And then you can see that number is much lower in um, schools ser serving students with the highest concentration of poverty. And then that gap just widens in secondary schools. So again, the pink is public high schools and the green is secondary schools that are serving students with the highest concentration of poverty. And if you take into account all of those things, the inequities in music education between these kind of schools, that gap seems much bigger than just 10%. All right, so to wrap up a little bit, um, there's differences in music education based on urban and suburban schools. Um, especially, I believe this was in, yeah, Detroit, Michigan. Um, sorry. So if we take into account those inequities, only 31 to 60% of schools with high percentages of non-white students in the Detroit area offered any music instruction. So even thinking about the teacher experience, the amount of music education, this is the real number. So what can we do about this now? Um, so through my uh, project, I am working with teachers from across the country thanks to Facebook groups honestly. Um, I have interviewed um, two music educators right now about how they're using hip-hop in their classroom and what the differences they've seen in their um, like community um, and like bonding experiences through their students. And um, something that I didn't really think would impact it, obviously I did, but I didn't really sit and realize it, was COVID. I talked to a teacher and she was doing like a rap writing song with her chorus, and she said, okay, who wants to sing? And none of them raised their hand. And it was really interesting because like, 
you know, usually, especially with younger kids, they would be, like, super excited, but they were all like, oh, no, 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 no. So she offered them the ability to record their songs, and they all did audio recordings, which was really interesting. So you have to really take into account how COVID has affected all of this, too. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to continue to interview as many people as I can. I'm trying to observe people who are using hip-hop in their classroom. There's two teachers I know in Rochester that I'm looking to do observations with. Um, but those are my next steps. So. so I want you to think about this statement right now. Is hip-hop really so inappropriate for young students? Not true. Students are going to listen to hip-hop no matter what you say, whether you like it or not. Hip-hop is rooted in the cultures of a majority of our students, and it is wrong to assume that it's all made up of curse words and profanity and is inappropriate to teach in the classroom. Hip-hop is art. Next time you're listening to a hip-hop song, listen to the vocabulary used. Listen for the fluidity. The, liter the literary techniques, and you will hear so much more about what is behind those lyrics. Chances are it will be things that your students are learning about in language classes right now, in their traditional boring studies of novels and poetry and things that are going to make them bang their head on the desk and fall asleep. That's all I got. Um, also, if anyone is like interested in learning about Presidential Scholars Program, um, it's been like one of the highlights of my my time at Crane right now because it's allowed me to like talk to so many people about a subject area that I'm really interested in, um, and like just really broaden my horizons. So I am um, the little blur that we have to put in there, um, but I can send you guys the link and we can like talk about it because it is super, super, super awesome. And yeah, thank you all.